Well, this is the most popular approach, okay, so-called cipher block chaining. The idea here is that we're going to somehow sort of disguise the plain text before we encrypt it. And in a sense, uh, if you think about it, it's similar to what we talked about with a classic code book where we used an additive. And hopefully you saw that in the homework assignment. Okay, an additive is just sort of a random sequence that you add into the plain text, okay, before you encrypt. So to decrypt, you have to undo that before you look it up in the code. This is somewhat analogous to that, okay? It's a similar idea. Okay, but to make this work, we need a little bit more information, okay? We can't just encrypt our, we need more than the code book uh, and the key, okay? We actually need uh, what they call an initialization vector. So this is sort of the thing, uh, sort of like picking the random spot in the uh, additive book, okay? It just, tell, it just sort of gets the ball rolling, okay? Gets the whole encryption process started. Okay, so we'll call that IV, or initialization vector. Clever how these things work, isn't it? It's not secret, okay, that's good. So we don't have to treat it like a key, we can just send it to the other side. Everybody can see it, Trudy gets to see it, so that makes it easy to deal with, all right? Um, okay, so the process, the definition of CBC mode encryption is going to be the following. The first block we have to treat special, okay, so the first block of plain text, P0 here, we XOR the initialization vector in and then we encrypt with the key, okay. From then on, what we do is we take the previous ciphertext block, XOR that with the plain text before we encrypt, okay, so it's chaining one block into the next block, and it's doing that with ciphertext, okay, that's the cipher block chaining, right? Uh, okay, so we can define this encryption, that's fine, okay, but of course we better be able to decrypt. Your cipher is not going to be popular if you can only encrypt and you can't decrypt, okay. So can we go backwards? Can we decrypt? Well, okay, so I claim this works here. Okay, so what's going on here? If you have the key and you know the initialization vector, what do you do? Okay, take that first ciphertext block, decrypt it with the key K, what do you get? Well, whatever you encrypted, that's what you get, right? Okay, you just get it back. So you get back the ID XOR with T0. Okay, so what you've done here is you've decrypted this guy, you get this, and you XOR in the ID again, you XOR the ID twice, those go away and you're just left with P0. Okay, so it's that magic property of the XOR again. And same thing here, right? You decrypt this, you get this guy, the XOR C0, that goes away. And, you know, also notice that if you're over here decrypting, you know all this stuff, right? You've received the ciphertext, you've received the initialization vector, you know the key, okay? So you can decrypt, okay? Okay, so we can encrypt and we can decrypt, all right? Uh, okay. So the beauty of this is that even if you have identical plain text blocks, you get different cipher text blocks. Okay, why is that? Because you're taking that initialization vector and sort of snowballs through, right, is in terms of encrypting the next cipher text block. And so you're sort of using the cipher text, which you can think of <coughs> as essentially like a random string of bits, right? Cipher text looks sort of like random bits, and you're XORing that to the plain text before you encrypt. So it's masking what that plain text looks like before it gets encrypted, before it gets looked up in the code book. Okay, and very similar to what you do with an additive in a classic uh, code book. Okay, but there's an issue here, okay, you might be concerned with if you think about this for a little bit. Okay, over here on the decryption side, right? And what do you do with ciphertext? Okay, if you're Alice, you encrypt the ciphertext, and then what? You send it to Bob, okay? So you send Bob the ciphertext. And when you send stuff, what can happen? You can lose packets. You can lose packets, okay, that's pretty bad. Or you can get errors, okay? It's errors of some type, okay? So bits can get flipped, okay? Zeros become ones, ones become zeros, and so on. So there's a potential concern here, right? What happens if the ciphertext is wrong? Okay, some of these bits in the ciphertext could be wrong. You're chaining these guys together. If you get one error, does that snowball and you get all kinds of errors and your whole plain text gets screwed up when you decrypt? That would be really bad. You know, 
that this would be an unusable sort of approach if that was a problem, if that was true. Okay, so let's look at that. Let's suppose some ciphertext block gets changed, changed to something. Let's just call it, uh, just suppose it's C1 and suppose it gets garbled into, uh, let's call it G. Okay, then what happens? Well, P0 is okay, because I assume all the other ciphertext blocks are okay, the ID is okay. So P0 is okay, because we didn't use C1 there. Okay, but now when you try to decrypt uh, to get P1, what happens? Well, you decrypt what you think is C0, right? But it's not, okay? So you get something else coming out here when you XOR in C0, and you don't get P1, okay? Almost surely, you don't get P1. You get something else, okay? Well, that's bad, <laughs> okay? Whole block is messed up. Now go on to the next block. What happens there? Well, C2 is okay, but you still use C1, at least what you think is C1 here, and it's not correct. So you don't get the correct answer here. Oh my God, this is snowballing. We're gonna have errors all over the place here, right? Right? <laughs> no, wrong. Okay, the thing is, that you only use, when you get to P3, you only use C3 and C2, right? You only use the current ciphertext block and the previous ciphertext block. So C1 never gets used again. It gets used in these two consecutive blocks, but it never gets used after that. So the point is, you know, if you had a small error here in this block, it would mess up two consecutive blocks. That could be a serious issue. But after that, at least, it washes out, and you don't get any more errors after those two consecutive blocks. I mean, just look at the form. You use two, you use the current ciphertext block and the previous one, but that's it, okay? Okay, got that? So, I mean, it could be serious. I mean, if you're using AES with a 256-bit key, you get a one-bit error in this guy in one block, what happens? 512 bits are messed up, right? So that's kind of bad, but at least it doesn't go forever. <laughs> Part where well, she could do the XOR, that's true. She could do this, she knows how to XOR, but she doesn't know how to do this, because oh, okay. she doesn't know the key, right? Okay, so got the picture here, got the point? Okay, you do get errors, and they do expand, but it doesn't mess up everything, yeah. After the XOR is done, wouldn't it look like EDC mode? Uh, after the XOR is done? Oh, well, that's a good question. Okay, I think I know what you're saying. Hold that thought, that could possibly show up in the homework. Uh, but <laughs> but um, um, so Trudy gets this, right? This is what Trudy gets to see. She gets to see the ciphertext. So, you know, um, yeah, so Trudy gets to see the ciphertext, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so I think what you're maybe, you may be thinking is, could she sort of convert this into an ECB mode? Yeah. No, she can't okay. in this case. Okay. I mean, think about it. It's encrypted. It's under the encryption. So there's no way to sort of peel this off without decrypting first. Oh, okay. You have to do the decryption before the... Right, right, right. That's, that's important. But that's a good question. So. I didn't understand what's the ECB mode. We talked about that last time. That's where you use it just like a code book, right? You just encrypt each block independently. Okay, um, okay so the point is, you know, the pro errors don't propagate forever. So that's good, okay? So you could use this in practice. You could get a few errors, you know, may expand a little bit, but at least it doesn't go on forever. Okay, you can actually still do that cut and paste thing we talked about. Uh, it's not quite as straightforward and some blocks don't come out correctly, but you can still make you can still make meaningful changes to the data. Okay, so you know integrity is still an issue here. Is really the bottom line. Okay, so here's the picture you should remember for <coughs> CDC mode. So again, this is the same picture of Alice. Uh, you know, an uncompressed image of Alice, uh, and it's encrypted here in CDC mode. And what the heck? Why doesn't it look like Alice when it did in ECB mode? What's the difference here? Because uh, white is not decoded at the same uh, value again. That's right. Okay, same plain text does not give you the same ciphertext. 
okay? This gives you something different because you're chaining these guys together. You're using the previous ciphertext to sort of cloud the picture before you encrypt. Okay, and again, that's the crucial property of ECB mode. Same plain text does not give you the same ciphertext. Okay? Wow, we're almost up to a majority now. That's good. We're getting here. Okay. Uh, okay, one more mode we want to mention here, so-called uh, counter mode. Uh, again, in practice, uh, CBC mode is used uh, by far the most. Counter mode, though, this is used a, a fair bit. Um, and the real uh, uh, reason you'd want to use this is for random access. Uh, what does that mean, random access? Yes, well, you have a long message, but you might want to read that's right, okay. I mean, it could be you encrypt your disk or something, and you want to read just part of it, okay? You don't want to start at the beginning, decrypt everything until you get up to this point, and decrypt, and, you know, just to decrypt some way in the middle, right? So you can jump anywhere and decrypt, okay? And that's where they use this a lot. Uh, okay, so it's, the goal here is really to, just to convert our block cipher into a stream cipher. So we're just going to use the code book, the block cipher, to create a key stream that we can XOR with the plain text, okay? Uh, to encrypt and same to decrypt. Okay, so, uh, can you shut the door back there? So, okay, so, um, again, we need an initialization vector, okay? Again, this is not secret, okay? You can just send it as part of the plain text or whatever. Um, so you just take the initialization vector, encrypt it with the key. That gives you a block of bits, right? Use that block of bits as a key stream, okay? So use that block of bits to XOR with the first plain text block, and that's the key stream you use to encrypt that block. Then for the next block, you just increment this guy by one uh, and do the same process, okay? So. As long as you know which block you're trying to encrypt, you know exactly what key string you use to encrypt that particular block. Okay, so that's encryption. Now how about decryption? Can we decrypt? Okay, so let's go over here. Uh, we take uh, C0 and we XOR uh, encrypt. Wait, this has got to be a typo, right? We're trying to decrypt here, not encrypt, so that should be a D, shouldn't it? Okay, I've been using these slides for how many years? There's no typos in these slides. So it's not a typo. Okay, why is it not a typo? It's just the same time in your sex mode. That's right. If you're, and you think of the stream cipher, right? If you're going to decrypt, you have to XOR exactly the same bits to decrypt as you use to encrypt. So you have to generate exactly the same key stream. So all you're doing is using this to generate the key stream. So you've got to do the same thing to generate the key stream here, okay? Uh, okay, now why would this be good? And, and it works, okay? Just the, again, the property of XOR, right? If you XOR the same thing in twice, it goes away, you're just left with the plain text. Um, okay, now why is this good for random access? That's right, as long as you know which block you're on, right? You have the IV, you have the key, you're good to go. You can decrypt that particular block without worrying about anything else before or after. What about CBC mode? Can we use CBC mode for random access? Uh, I say yes, we can use CBC mode for random access. Why is that? The block size would be greater than... The block the size same. is the same. It, it doesn't matter. Whatever the cipher is, that determines the block size. You just have to read extra couple, extra block. That's right. What do you need to know to decrypt a block in CBC mode? You have to know the current ciphertext block and the previous ciphertext block, and that's it. You don't have to know everything that came before, right? You just have to know those two blocks. So as long as you know the current ciphertext block and the previous guy, you can decrypt that specific block in CDC mode. And look at the formula. That's all it requires. Okay, so in most cases, that would be practical. You could just grab the previous guy and the current guy, decrypt the current guy. Okay, so you could do random access. Now, um, there is one significant limitation if you try to use CDC mode for random access. And I don't want to tell you because it's a homework question. Okay. But think about it. 